Thank you. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Mason Klim. I'm a PhD student. I work jointly with Ping Ching Dai and Ming Yi at Rice University. Um, and despite working with a neutron scatter and someone who does ARPEZ, this uh, project is actually entirely transport. So I will be discussing a little bit of ARPEZ and a little bit of uh, neutron in the context of this. Um, but today I'll be talking about um, orbital selective pairing in iron-based superconductors. So first I'll give some acknowledgements on some collaborators. So at Rice, we have people involved with um, sample growth and also just uh, directing the project and at the uh, National High Magnetic Field Lab in Tallahassee for transport measurements at high field. Uh, and then also at Argonne National Lab for some theory help. And then we also have our funding. So I'll start um, on a little bit of background and context on some iron-based superconductors. Um, and for those that know a bit about this, I will uh, clue you back in and pay a bit more attention. Um, but to start, um, I'll basically just say that the iron-based superconductors kind of demonstrated a uh, pretty important finding that uh, there's not just the lonely island of the cuprates uh, representing a family of high temperature superconductors. Um, additionally, the iron-based superconductors uh, offer a very rich platform to study the interplay between magnetism uh, and superconductivity. Um, notably in uh, these iron-based superconductors, you have this electronic pneumatic state uh, that emerges uh, at this um, structural transition. I'll talk about this uh, in a bit more detail. Um, but something that's sort of remained elusive is the microscopic origin of superconductivity um, and also in the pairing mechanism of the iron-based superconductors. Um, but there's been a number of uh, neutron scattering experiments, also STM. Uh, I don't include the STM stuff here, but um, that sort of uh, paint this picture of an orbital selective pairing mechanism in the iron-based superconductors. And hopefully the work that I show later sort of fit nicely into that uh, overall picture. Um, so first to start is to address uh, the issue of twin domains in iron-based superconductors, because uh, they serve as a bit of an obstacle when it comes to doing electronic transport. Um, so I mentioned earlier there's a diagonal to orthorhombic lattice distortion uh, that reduces the symmetry from C4 rotational to C2. Um, and in uh, these iron-based superconductors, there's the emergence of these twin domains. So this is noted by these pink and green uh, different domains here. And you can see how this clouds um, your ability to distinguish using traditional methods um, exactly uh, what the uh, rotational symmetry breaking is here. Um, but what you can do is you can apply uniaxial pressure um, along either the orthorhombic A or B axes, uh, and you'll get a preferred uh, one singular domain, which allows you to do uh, electronic transport measurements uh, all under a single domain, also neutron scattering as well. So first I'll start by talking about iron selenide. Um, my work will cover nickel base or nickel dope and cobalt dope uh, barium iron arsenic. Um, but iron selenium uh, represents a really important analog for this project. Um, and so first of all, let's start by explaining uh, the neutron spin resonance, which has been seen in iron selenide, it's also been seen in uh, the nickel dope barium iron arsenic. Um, so first to just explain a little bit of the importance of it. Um, this is the magnetic or spin excitation that occurs in electromagnetic or spinistic wave wave vectors. Um, it's something that links a bunch of unconventional superconductors, different families. So you have uh, this signal that shows up in the cuprates and the heavy fermions, which shows some triplet superconductor candidates, and also obviously in the iron-based superconductors. So it's sort of this overarching thing that connects them all. And kind of uh, uh, underpinning it all, uh, excuse me, uh, Kind of underpinning all of this um, is uh, Fermi surface nesting region. So uh, nesting along one direction can induce uh, spin fluctuations. So in the case of uh, barium ion arsenic, uh, you have um, above this structural diagonal state this isotopic nest state uh, with Q1 and Q2 electronic nest state and Z1 and Dx is the orbital uh, respective. And when you drop below into the uh, electronic matic state, you have this preferential nesting, uh, very nice for the py uh, for electrons of pyz uh, orbital. Um, and so basically, 
what you come with is that if there is uh, spin fluctuation that can be induced by this nesting condition, and you have an anisotropic nesting condition here, then one might expect to see anisotropic spin fluctuations, and this resonance would be anisotropic uh, for ion selenide. And indeed, it is. Um, I'm definitely oversimplifying the thinking, but it also comes from things in the group. Um, but the basic takeaway here is if you look at these two points here, corresponding to the the uh, Fermi sort of nesting condition at the time, uh, that if you look at the one with uh, uh, associated with uh, DYB orbital, um, you take a subtraction above and below, take the difference above and below CT, and you see this uh, spin resonance at between three and four MeV. If you do it likewise for um, the uh, signal associated uh, along the other direction, you see uh, no signal. You have some anisotropy in the spin spectrum. Um, this is important because we can also do the same thing in nickel dope or cobalt dope um, barium ion arsenic. Just to give you a bit of a rundown, uh, there's two sides of the phase diagram here. One we call underdope, and one we call overdope. On the underdope side, you have the old topic structural phase shift, uh, which encapsulates the electronic magnetic phase. And at high enough doping, you enter the superconducting group phase uh, that persists between the underdope and overdope. Um, and just to give a little reflection, uh, in the end set, you have this structure that I mentioned earlier that you can see the range. And then on the right, you have these. Uh, Mason, uh, Mason, I, I think. Um... Uh, I think I was not alone in not hearing too well. Uh, maybe you want to get oh. closer to the audio. Oh. Is there? Um... This is much better. This is better. Yes. Yeah, much better. Yeah, just make it really close to the microphone and speak. Yeah. Oh. To... Yeah. How yeah. much? How much did people miss? Did I blow through? It no, we heard you. We I, I think it was just not uh, yeah. too good. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, good. Okay. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, then in the second. Um, the second inset, basically, we have uh, the uh, the ideal nesting condition here, showing basically green representing spin fluctuations, red representing no spin fluctuations. Um, so you can test the same thing in cobalt doped barium ion arsenic, and indeed, this is the similar result. You have the neutron resonance that shows up along the one zero zero direction, which Q one we label, and no resonance along Q two. Um, now, if you're familiar with all of this, this is I guess in because this is linked to the, the original research. Um, so basically, the key takeaway here is that if it is true that the neutron spin residence is associated with the superconducting electron pairing, um, then these results show that superconducting in iron arsenides and selenides is orbital selective, and it's dominated by the EYZ orbitals, and they're associated with antiferromagnetic fluctuation, which is corresponding to the Q1 direction. So how do we actually further investigate this? Um, well, we can do a transport measure. And so what we can look at here is on the underdope side of this phase diagram. Basically, when you drop into the superconducting transition, there's a reduction in the static magnetic or antiferromagnetic order. And taken together, one would expect that there's some anisotropic superconducting state. In other words, if we pass a field along both the Q1 directions and Q2 directions, we would expect there to be an anisotropic upper critical field associated with the superconducting, uh, with the superconducting. Um, what we can also do is we can exploit the other side of the phase diagram, where there's no thrombic phase transition and there's an absence of electronic mimicity in the sample. Um, so we can also ask what might happen there. Um, if it is true that the superconduct superconductivity is orbital selective, um, then we would expect the overdope side to perhaps not show any anisotropy. And so this is our basic setup on the insets you can see. Um, this is an underdoped and overdoped sample of barium iron arsenic. And this is done with the Montgomery method, measuring uh, the resistivity along A and B simultaneously. Um, and then we pass an uh, external field along the A axis and the B axis. Um, and basically, uh, for reasons I'll explain in a second, um, this data is not as uh, useful as what I'll show you. So on the underdoped and overdoped clear 
immediate difference you can see is that the underdose does the anisotropy, the overdose does not. What we can do is we can use a 90% threshold, which is the normal standard deviation. These when it drops to 90, uh, and then you record that as the onset of TC. Uh, and when we do this, you see uh, you see uh, what appears to be anisotropy along one direction uh, and not along the other. But there's a key takeaway from this data, which makes it a little bit suspect, is that it's actually conditional. So what I mean by this is that when you have the field and the current along the same direction, you can have some interference. And in this case, when you have the field and current along the same direction, you actually have TC enhanced. Um, and when you have them perpendicular, uh, TC is reduced. And so there's actually a workaround we have for this. Um, so in this data, it's useful, but it's not complete. Um, so what we can actually do is we can use a Corbino geometry. And what the Corbino geometry does is it allows for the current to pass along the C-axis, so that no matter what the field orientation is, um, it's, always pair of, it's always perpendicular to the current direction. Um, so you can see here, we basically have it's a concentric circle with a little dot in the middle. And then on the other side, um, you have the exact same thing, and we pass current along the C-axis. And then we apply field along the base of the axes in this way. The results of this, um, I'll just show you a bit more about the, uh, uh, just the raw data first. So we have on the left underdoped data, on the right overdoped data. This is done at the National High Magnetic Field Lab. We have static magnetic field up to 41 Tesla. And this is just with the current along, or sorry, just with the field along A first. Um, when I show you the uh, resulting uh, anisotropy here, it becomes quite clear. So uh, you have 0 through 41 Tesla. Um, and you can see that at 41 Tesla, the anisotropy opens up quite nicely. Whereas in the overdose case, you have uh, very little anisotropy, if any at all. It seems to be fairly isotropic. Mm. Uh, then if we plot the 90% um, criterion here, you can see that the anisotropy opens up in a nice way. Uh, it continues to expand in at higher and higher fields. Uh, we can also use a criterion here, which shows a lesser degree of the anisotropy, but still there. Um, and you can even do this for 10% uh, as well, and you see same 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 result. Uh, just the anisotropy is a little bit less every time. Um, whereas on the overdose side of things, you actually don't see any anisotropy at all. Um, these error bars here, you may be asking, uh, are actually uh, introduced to overcome this, uh, these humps that we see. Um, I can address them uh, in a little bit. Um, but basically, these error bars are taken for account whether we define the uh, normal state resistivity as the flat region for the hump, or if we classify the peak of the hump uh, as being the normal state resistivity. Um, in either case, um, the anisotropy lives on in the underdope sample, whereas in the overdope sample, uh, it's completely gone. Um, likewise, uh, questions may be asked about um, the role of uh, vortex physics in this. And so what we can do is we can extract the um, uh, activation energy here uh, by plotting the log of the resistivity and then the inverse of the temperature here and, extract, and uh, perform a linear fit. We extract the uh, activation energy, and the anisotropy follows a different uh, follows a different pattern than that of the uh, raw data. So the pure resistivity follows a completely different path. So it's safe to say that these things are independent. We can rule out the vortex physics in this. Uh, additionally, we can look at the MR effect, um, and uh, to rule out any sort of uh, role in the antiferromagnetic order in this. Um, and so basically, on the left, we have going up to uh, less than 1%, less than 1% of 1%. Um, of 1 yeah, maybe say you need to be closer again. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, less than 1% of 1%, um, which means basically completely negligible. Um, so the antiferromagnetic order has any role in this. Um, you can also see the raw data from 30 Tesla um, plotted showing the normal states uh, resistivity overlapping. Um, so I sort of uh, blew through and anticipate. 
Um, but a part of this is the uh, spell, uh, a part of the uh, publication efforts for this, uh, they require a, a visual app nice for summarizing, uh, summarizing the story here. So uh, first we have this uh, early surface nesting with favorable nesting in the DYZ orbitals uh, along the Q1 direction. Um, then we apply a, a unilateral pressure to uh, uh, nickel dope barium ion arsenic and apply a field along the A and B axes. And what we find is that when you apply a field along the B axis, you have these uh, superinducting electrons that are unaffected uh, and, or at least not suppressed to the same extent as when you apply the field along the A axis, um, where you see the uh, pairing for the DYZ electrons. Um, are suppressed in comparison. Um, additionally, we can look at, in principle, um, iron selenide as well to do this. But there's a bit of a there's a bit of an obstacle when it comes to putting iron selenide. It's soft and must be mounted to barium iron arsenic substrate, which is difficult to do the Corvino geometry. We need to have context on both sides, but we think we have a clever workaround for it. Um, so that's something that's planned for the future. Um, I can also just open it up to put a QR code here in case people would like um, to see the paper on the archive. It'll soon be published on Cell Report Civic, which is a new channel. Um, they said uh, to tell your friends about it, they let us uh, publish there for free, which is nice. And since you came to my talk, uh, I'll consider you friends, I guess. Um, so you can stay friends. Okay, on that note, thank you, Mason. Any questions, comments for Mason? I thought I saw a hand, but maybe I didn't. Maybe I can ask a question. Um, so, uh, so I wasn't quite clear what the picture is. Um, are you saying that because uh, states on a Fermi surface have uh, um, sort of uh, have an orbital distribution as you go around the Fermi surface, um, the pairing is orbital selective, or are you saying something else? Would you mind clarifying? Yeah, the spin fluctuations seem to be a result of this uh, Fermi surface nesting in this material. So there's a ARPES, this schematic is based off some ARPES results. Um, and basically, if the inelastic neutron scattering that I showed at the beginning is true, um, well, if the inelastic neutron scattering is indeed showing that these spin fluctuations are anisotropic, and this is related to the, and the origin is in this Fermi surface nesting, um, then it's safe to say that the pairing mechanism itself is orbital selective. Mm -hmm. And when we do this transport measurement, um, and we show that the resistivity along the A and B axes yields different upper critical fields. Sorry, when the field along A and B axes uh, reveals a different upper critical field. Um, then basically what we can say, uh, the basic conclusion is it's consistent. Uh, it's consistent with the Fermi surface nesting picture, consistent with the uh, inelastic neutron scattering, and it's consistent with the idea that this is a orbital select pairing mechanism, uh, particularly when you pair it with the overdoped sample. So the overdoped sample exists on the phase diagram uh, with no uh, electronic pneumatic state. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it doesn't undergo the same Fermi surface reconstruction that the uh, underdope sample does when it crosses from the tetragonal to the atomic state. OK, thank you. We, we, we still have uh, five minutes to go, so uh, I can follow up. But if somebody else has a question or comment, please take it over. 
if not maybe i can press on this point um so mm -hmm. so when you say uh, in last neutral scattering together with um uh the orbital effect etc um sort of uh, combined to um to paint a consistent picture what what's the frequency range of the magnetic excitations do you have in mind is is that the range that you're showing or is it Mason, can you speak closer to the microphone, please? Sorry, you said the uh, you said the uh, frequency range. Yeah. Um. Well, the magnetic. No, so so when you say that the orbital selective nesting and the uh, field, uh, the HC two and all these combine to give you a consistent story. Um, wh which frequency range of the spin? Fluctuations do you have in mind that that come into this picture? Is it low energy or high energy or the, the energy fluctuations? So this is a, the, the resonance um, from inelastic. Speak closer to the microphone, please. Sorry. Three, three and a half <laughs> from the inelastic neutron spin. Yeah, basically the the idea is that the, the neutron spin resonance is a spin singular to triplet excitation. Basically, mm -hmm. it's a direct measure of the electron Cooper pairs, at least a consequence of electron Cooper pairs. So, so if that's the case, then then what you actually seen is that, uh, you know, in the case of iron selenide, the the, the electron pairing is a uh, spin singular to triplet happens around uh, you know three point four, mm -hmm. and in in the you know, connectite, the nickel dope connectite anodope is like four five yeah, millivolts. It's four point, yeah, it's yeah, 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 four point seven millivolts. Right. So, so in this regime, that that basically suggests that you know since it only appears in one direction. And that basically suggests the DYZ orbital that's coupled with the the, uh, the superconducting electrons. And basically, his transport measurement basically confirmed that point. Mm -hmm. But I guess my point uh, uh, at this point, I, maybe I can ask questions. So, so the the spin fluctuations extend to very high energies, right? So so this uh, analysis so far doesn't no no uh, it doesn't doesn't see anything with the high energy excitations, which could no. also participate in superconductivity. Well, but but the electron actual electron Cooper pair, you know, given T C, right? Electron Cooper pair is is really low energy, right? So okay, I, 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 do anything. I got a picture uh, of our wish energy range. Thank you. Yes, Any you other much. questions or comments? If not, I think uh, let's thank uh, Mason.